Well, let's just begin with a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we do just come before you today, Lord, um, seeking your wisdom, seeking the treasure of your word. Uh, Lord God, may you open to each of our hearts and minds the treasures that are in your word. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. So we've been talking for the last few weeks about the principle in Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7, which says, The Lord God is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgressions, and sin, yet he will, be, he will by no means leave unpunished visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. And we've also been looking at the principle in Ezekiel chapter 18, uh, and we're going to read just verse 20 here, which says, The person whose sins will die, the son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. And so we've been seeing that these two passages are not in contradiction, because there's a difference between visiting the iniquity and punishing the iniquity. And so we've been looking last week at how, through the life of King Manasseh, how God accepted the repentance of Manasseh when he sinned. But he still promised that there would be consequences to that sin. And we looked at the reign of Manasseh's righteous grandson, Josiah, of whom God said in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 19, Because your heart, Josiah, was tender, and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse. And you have torn your clothes and wept before me. I truly have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you will be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes will not see all the evil which I shall bring upon this place. And so the sins of Manasseh were visited upon Josiah, but he repented. He did right. He did not walk in the ways of his uh, grandfather Manasseh before he repented. He walked in the ways of Manasseh after he repented. <laughs> and he did right. And God said, you know what? You shall not see any of this. Now I want you to look carefully, though. Uh, we're going to be looking at, at this um, principle now that's given to us in verse 20. Uh, or I should say, maybe not a principle, but we're going we're to just see how God works, actually works this out. Um, you see here that he told Josiah that his eyes would not see the evil which God would bring on this place. Notice it doesn't say he was going to bring it upon this people. He says he's going to bring this evil upon this place. Now this message was repeated by the prophet Jeremiah. It was proclaimed repeatedly to all the people of Jerusalem and Judah. In Jeremiah chapter 21 verse 8 we read this. Listen for, listen for the same idea here that we talked about now God's going to bring the evil on this place. Jeremiah 21.8 You shall say to this people, thus says the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. He who dwells in this city will die by the sword and by famine and by pestilence. But he who goes out and falls away to the Chaldeans who are besieging you will live. He will have his own life as his booty, for I have set my face against this city for harm and not for good, declares the Lord. It will be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he will burn it with fire. This 
uh, passage in Jeremiah 21 complies with the principle of Ezekiel 18. God said, if you listen, I'm bringing these consequences on this place here, he says, but if you listen, you will have your own life as your booty. You don't have to die. The sons not, do not have to die for the sins of the fathers. If they listened and they did what they were instructed, they would not die. Notice also how he says, again, he says, I have set my face against this city. He doesn't say against this people. He said, against this city for harm and not for good. It will be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he will burn it with fire. It doesn't say they will be given into the hand of Babylon, and he will burn them with fire. Listen also to this passage, Jeremiah 19, 14. Then Jeremiah came from Topheth, where the Lord had sent him to prophesy. And he stood in the court of the Lord's house, and he said to all the people, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I am about to bring on this city and all its towns the entire calamity that I have declared against it, because they have stiffened their necks so as not to heed my words. Again, the calamity is on this city and all its towns, the reason was that the calamity had begun was because of the sin of Manasseh, right? The sin of Manasseh. And, uh, but the reason it fell on these particular people was because they also sinned. Because only if, it says here, they had stiffened their necks. They were walking in the same manner as Manasseh. And do you realize that it was about 80 years from the sin of Manasseh to the destruction of Jerusalem? That's a long time. The, again, the whole, the whole generation of Josiah passed by the curse because they repented. They walked in the way of the Lord. They did what was right. They were not going to experience any of this calamity. But even now, at the time of the calamity, God still says, the calamity is coming upon this, this place. But if you listen to me, you'll have your life as your booty. 80 years is a pretty long time. 80 years from now is about 1940. What was happening in 1940? <laughs> 80 years from now, now we think we're living in a fairly wicked generation, right? There's a, there's a lot of wickedness increasing right now. 80 years from now is the year 3000. <laughs> I wonder if they will remember in the year 3000, what we did today. God does. <laughs> I want to look at the original proclamation that God made against Manasseh 80 years earlier to the day of which we're studying here today. 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 13. This is what God had said to Manasseh at the time that he sinned. God said, I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. I will abandon the remnant of my inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies. And they will become as plunder and spoil to all their enemies because they have done evil in my sight and have been provoking me to anger since the day their fathers came from Egypt, even to this day. If you look carefully at this passage, there's nothing about death. <laughs> no one has to die. He says he's going to turn it upside down and wipe it like a dish. He's going to deliver them into the hand of their enemies. They will become as plunder and spoil to their enemies. But no one had to die. And that's in accordance with Ezekiel 18. The soul that sins will die. There were consequences but did not have to include the terrible loss of life. If they listen at this time to the word of God through Jeremiah and they humbly submitted to Nebuchadnezzar, God was going to bring wrath on that place and this city. What did he tell them? Go to Babylon. Go give yourself to Nebuchadnezzar. You'll have your life as your booty. 
The, the calamity was coming on this place, in this city. If you're not in this place, in this city, see, you avoid the calamity. He says, go to Babylon. Go out to Nebuchadnezzar. Don't fight. Don't resist. Go into exile. I have proclaimed it. If they did that, the, the, the calamity was coming on that city and that place. If they're in Babylon, they're not there. There were still consequences. The consequence was coming because of the sin, but no one had to die. The true consequence was the exile. It was leaving their land and their homes and their possessions, losing their prosperity. But do you see what that really is? That's just stuff, right? They were just going to really lose their stuff. That, that was the, the, the real, the, the bottom line. That's all the consequence had to be was you're going to lose your stuff, your home, your lands, your prosperity. You're going to go into a foreign land. Material goods. That's all that the consequence had to be, no more. Now I want to read from Jeremiah chapter 29 what God told those who did go into exile. So we're kind of skipping ahead in the story, but I want you to follow this theme carefully so that as we read what actually happened, you can see what, what could have happened. Now, uh, a, a, quite a number, as we know, quite a number of the Jews did go into exile. This is what Jeremiah in chapter 29 told those who went into exile in Babylon. Jeremiah 29, verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And, and they all could have gone into exile. <laughs> God says, if you go out, you'll have your life as your booty, but most of them did not, yet some of them did. But here's what he said to those who did go into exile. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and become fathers of sons and daughters, that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply and don't decrease. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will have welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you and do not listen to the dreams which they dream, for they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. What the prophets, false prophets, were prophesying in the exile is, we are going back in two years. God said, no, 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 it's going to be 70 years, not two years. They were saying, we're going back, we're going, God's going to bring us back. He was, he's not going to, he's not, he, we are going to defeat Nebuchadnezzar. That was a false prophecy. Verse 10, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. These are the children who are in exile because of the sins of their fathers. But do they have a terrible life? Build houses and live in them. <laughs> Plant gardens and eat. Get married and have children and grandchildren. That's what God said. God was going to bless them in the land of their exile. And that is what happened. Remember when, when Mordecai got in trouble with Haman? Uh, you know, they proclaimed this... Uh, uh, War against the Jews, and part of the thing was they could take all their possessions because they amassed possessions even in the land of their exile. And remember that also in the midst of, of this exile, there is a true silver lining. Remember, we've talked about this. 
It's in hardship that we cry out to the Lord, right? Typically. We asked this question a few weeks ago. If you could choose for yourself a life of prosperity or a life of hardship, which should you choose? (laughs) The life of hardship, because that's in prosperity, that's when we tend to forget God. A life of hardship, that's when we cry out to the Lord. So in the midst of this consequence, which is the exile, they were to build houses, plant gardens, eat, get married, have children and grandchildren, and in the midst of all that hardship, cry out to the Lord. And that's what God says. If you, if you call upon me and seek me with all of your heart, you'll find me. Do you see how we can trust the Lord? Even in the midst of suffering and the consequences of sin. In the midst of of us suffering for the consequences of our own sin and the sin of our fathers, we can trust God. He's still going to take care of us. He's still going to have mercy if we repent, if we listen, if we do what we're instructed. What was one of the things that God instructed? He said, you pray for the city in which I'm sending you because in its peace you will have peace. You know that they were tempted to be bitter against the Babylonians, right? Bitter at God. Why? I mean, let's face it. It's not easy to lose everything and go to a foreign land. (laughs) Not easy. So God said, you pray for those people. Because for 70 years, if they have peace, you'll have peace. Amazing. Amazing. That was God working on their attitude in the midst of their exile. Don't be bitter. (laughs) Don't be bitter at me. Don't be bitter at them. You pray for them. Pray for them. And the fate of Jeremiah chapter 29 could have been the fate of the whole entire nation had they just obeyed and listened. Listen to Jeremiah chapter 27, verse 12. Jeremiah says, I spoke words like these to Zedekiah, the king of Judah, saying, bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him and his people and live. Why will you die, you and your people, by the sword and famine and pestilence, as the Lord has spoken to that nation which will not serve the king of Babylon? The whole nation could have had this fate of building houses, planting gardens, getting married, having children and grandchildren in in a foreign land. Okay. Not your first choice. I understand. There are consequences to sin, but you see God's incredible mercy. No one has to die. And you you can have a good life in this land to where you're going if you just listen. Serve the king of Babylon. Not their first choice. So now we're going to see what actually did happen. And and certainly we just, we skipped, (laughs) we we cheated and skipped ahead here as as we see those who did go into the exile and God did command them those things. But last week we left off at the death of Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim was the Uh, grandson of Josiah, no, excuse me, the the son of Josiah. Uh, Jehoiakim uh, reigned 11 years. He died. He rebelled. He tried to fight against Nebuchadnezzar, and he met a terrible death. Um, But uh, Jerusalem was not actually conquered at that time. And so after the death of Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim's son, Jehoiachin, became king. He was also called Jeconiah. And in 2 Kings 24, 9, we read this, that uh, Jehoiachin did evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father had done. Uh, Jehoiachin, the son of Jehoiakim. (laughs) Got to keep them straight. (laughs) 
Now Jehoiachin only reigned three months in Israel, and we read this in 2 Kings 24.10. Now at that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, went up to Jerusalem, and the city came under siege. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to the city while his servants were besieging it. And Jehoiachin, the king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon, he and his mother and his servants and his captains and his officials. So the king of Babylon took him captive in the eighth year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, three months into the reign of Jehoiachin, and he carried out from there all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house, and he cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, just as the Lord had said. Then he led away into exile all Jerusalem and the captains and all the men of valor, 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and the smiths, none remained except the poorest of the land. So he led Jehoiachin away into exile to Babylon, also the king's mother and the king's wives and his officials and the leading men of the land. He led away into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, all the men of valor, 7,000, and the craftsmen and the smiths, 1,000, all strong and fit for war, and these the king of Babylon brought into exile to Babylon. So I think, you have, I think we have a, a, a cumulative effect there. It talks about 10,000 and then 7,000 and then 1,000. So I didn't go into great detail to try to study that, but probably about 19,000 then that were led away into exile. As the Lord had said, that was what they were supposed to do. Now Jehoiachin was... He was not called, he said, was evil. He walked in the way of his fathers. But he did listen. He did listen to this command. God said, go and give your, present yourselves to, and serve them. And this is what they did. Jehoiachin voluntarily went out. The city was under siege, but the city was not actually defeated. He went out <laughs> before they broke through the walls or before they had given up. The city was then plundered, but it was not destroyed. And so we see at this time, only some of the prophecies have been fulfilled. Um, it was of Jehoiachin and the exiles, those who did present themselves to King Nebuchadnezzar, that God said in Jeremiah 24, verse 5, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, like these good figs, so I will regard as good the captives of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans. For I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them up and not overthrow them. I will plant them and not pluck them up. So that was part one. After the deportation of Jehoiachin and these 19,000, Nebuchadnezzar made a new king to reign. Uh, he changed his name to Zedekiah. And Nebuchadnezzar made Zedekiah swear allegiance to him. Zedekiah now was actually the third son of Josiah to become king. Remember Josiah's first son, Jehoahaz, had been only reigned three months and he was taken off to Egypt and he died there. And then his other son, Jehoiakim, was made king. He reigned 11 years. We talked about him last week. He died a very bad death. Jehoiakim's uh, son, then Jehoiachin, the grandson of Josiah, is the one who has gone out into the exile. And now we've got Zedekiah, who was his uncle, who makes him the son of Josiah, the third son of Josiah now, who has begun, begun to reign. And he swore allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar to serve him. This is what God had said. But in 2 Kings chapter 24, 18, we read this. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. For through the anger of the Lord, this came about in Jerusalem and Judah until he cast them out from his presence, and Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. So here's, we've had the first exile, Zedekiah is made king, Zedekiah swears allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar, but then he rebels 
He rebels. He does not keep the allegiance. And this is what God had told him to do. This is what Jeremiah had told him to do. Uh, One of the reasons that Zedekiah rebelled was because of the corrupt priesthood and the false prophets. Listen to what they were saying in Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 13. Jeremiah says, but ah, Lord God, I said, look, the prophets are telling them, you will not see the sword, you will not have famine, but I will give you lasting peace in this place. Then the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying falsehood in my name. I have neither sent them nor commanded them nor spoken to them. They are prophesying a false vision, divination, futility, and the deception of their own minds. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who are prophesying in my name, although it was not I who sent them, yet they keep saying, there will be no sword or famine in this land. By sword and famine, those prophets shall meet their end. The people also to whom they are prophesying will be thrown out into the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword. And there will be no one to bury them, neither them, nor their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters. For I will pour out their own wickedness upon them. At the time that Jehoiachin had gone out, the city was not defeated. The city was beginning to suffer, but they hadn't had the famine and the sword and the pestilence yet. But Zedekiah listened to these false prophets who were saying, No, no, God is going to deliver us from the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. We should rebel, we should fight, we should not submit. This is what they were saying. And unfortunately, Zedekiah and the people listened to the false prophets and not to Jeremiah. Zedekiah, after Zedekiah rebelled against the Chaldeans, they came back to the city (laughs) and they put it back under siege. And so many died because of famine and disease. And all these words came true. And you can read so many terrible words in the book of Jeremiah. If if you rebel, if you don't listen, if you rebel against Nebuchadnezzar, this is what's going to happen. The sword, famine, and pestilence will be your end. But even so, even so, in Jeremiah chapter 38... Before Jerusalem actually fell, now there had already been a lot of uh, famine and pestilence, but the sword had not yet come into the city. (laughs) Before the city fell, uh, Zedekiah was uh, concerned, very concerned, grew concerned. Maybe the false prophets weren't right. Maybe Jeremiah was right. And so King Zedekiah arranged a secret meeting between himself and Jeremiah And he pleaded, Jeremiah, tell me the truth. Don't hold back. I need to know what the Lord says. In Jeremiah 38, verse 17, uh, we want to read and and listen. Even at the last hour, listen as we read this to the available mercy of God. So Jeremiah said to King Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, If you will indeed go out to the officers of the king of Babylon, then you will live, and this city will not be burned with fire, and you and your household will survive. But if you will not go out to the officers of the king of Babylon, then this city will be given over to the hand of the Chaldeans, and they will burn it with fire, and you yourself will not escape from their hand. Then King Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, But I dread the Jews who have gone over to the Chaldeans, For they may give me over into their hand, and they will abuse me. But Jeremiah said, they will not give you over. Please obey the Lord in what I am saying to you, that it may go well with you, and that you may live. But if you keep refusing to go out, this is the word which the Lord has shown me. Then behold, all the women who have been left in the palace of the king of Judah, are going to be brought out to the officers of the king of Babylon. And those women will say, your close friends have misled and overpowered you. While your feet were sunk in the mire, they turned back. 
They will also bring out all your wives and your sons to the Chaldeans, and you yourself will not escape from their hand, but will be seized by the hand of the king of Babylon, and this city will be burned with fire. That secret meeting in Jeremiah chapter 38 was after the food had all run out in Jerusalem. It was just, it doesn't say exactly how long, but it was only a few days at the most weeks before the end. Even at the last hour, God was through Jeremiah begging, just obey, you can live, you don't have to die. Unfortunately, Zedekiah did not listen. He didn't listen. 2 Kings chapter 25. Now in the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, on the tenth day of the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his army, against Jerusalem, camped against it, and built a siege wall all around it. So the city was under siege until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. On the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. And then the city was broken into, and the men of war fled by night by way of the gate between the two walls beside the king's garden, though the Chaldeans were all around the city. And they went out by way of the Arabah. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho, And all his army was scattered from him, and they captured the king and brought him to Babylon, the king of Babylon, at Riblah, and he passed sentence on him. And they slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, and then they put out the eyes of Zedekiah and brought him with bronze fetters and brought him to Babylon. What a terrible end. It didn't have to be. The book of 2 Chronicles describes the end this way. 2 Chronicles 36, 11. Now Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord his God. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet who spoke for the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear allegiance by God. But Zedekiah stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord God of Israel. Furthermore, all the officials and the priests of the people were very unfaithful, following all the abominations of the nations. And they defiled the house of the Lord, which he had sanctified in Jerusalem. And the Lord, the God of their fathers, sent word to them again and again by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they continually mocked the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people until there was no remedy Therefore he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and he had no compassion on young man or virgin, old man or infirm. He gave them all into his hand. And all the articles of the house of God, the great and the small, and the treasuries, treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and his officers, he brought them all to Babylon. And they burned the house of God, And they broke down the wall of Jerusalem, and he burned all its fortified buildings with fire and destroyed all its valuable articles. And those who had escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon, and they were servants to him and his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. All the days of its desolation, it kept Sabbath until 70 years were complete. What can we learn from this? We must not stiffen our necks. We must not stubbornly cling to our own ways. We must not be ignorant of the sins of our fathers. The Apostle Paul understood this. 
In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1, we read this. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And they all ate the same spiritual food and all drank from the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now these things happened as examples for us, so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. This is not just an Old Testament thing. This is the Apostle Paul. Do not be unaware, brethren, what your fathers did. That's why we have the word of God. That's why we have these stories. That we can learn from them. The prophet Zechariah lived at the end of the 70 years of the exile, at the beginning of the reign of the kings of Persia, which would have been 150 years from the sin of Manasseh. Listen to what the Lord said to Zechariah in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 1. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah the prophet, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, saying, The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, declares the Lord of hosts, that I may return to you. Says the Lord of hosts, Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets proclaimed, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return now from your evil ways and your evil deeds. But they did not listen or give heed to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But did not my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, overtake your fathers? Then they repented and said, As the Lord of hosts purposed to do to us in accordance with our ways and our deeds, so he has dealt with us. 150 years after the sin of Manasseh, the Lord is still saying to Zechariah, <laughs> Return! Don't you know how angry I was with your fathers? Don't walk in their ways. Don't do those sins. Learn from them. Return to me that I may return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do you remember Je Jehoiachin, who went out to Nebuchadnezzar and submitted to the Chaldeans and went into exile? Remember that he was not called the good king? Since he was evil, he walked in the ways of his fathers. He did, however, listen, and he did, however, surrender, and he did submit to the Chaldeans. Listen to this, 2 Kings chapter 25, 27. Now it came about in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 27th day of that month, that evil Merodach, the king of Babylon, in the year that he became king, released Jehoiachin, king of Judah, from prison. And he spoke kindly to him, and he set his throne above all the thrones of the kings that were with him in Babylon. And Jehoiachin changed his prison clothes, and he had meals in the king's presence regularly all the days of his life. And for his allowance, a regular allowance was given to him by the king, a portion for each day, all the days of his life. Jehoiachin listened. He obeyed. He was not killed. And after 37 years of humbling, he was lifted up. If you had given Jehoiachin the choice 37 years earlier, here you go, Jehoiachin, take your pick. You continue in the lap of luxury as the king of your land, or you suffer as a prisoner in a foreign land. What would you choose? <laughs> if Jehoiachin had made the first choice, he would have died like Zedekiah and Jehoiakim. His suffering, it would appear to me, brought about some humility. 
What does God say? I'm opposed to the proud, but I give grace to the humble. And 37 years later, Jehoiachin, in the land of exile, was lifted up, taken out of the prison, and <laughs> given a good life. And you know some of the Bible characters who grew up in this captivity, right? They grew up in captivity because of the sins of their fathers. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel, Esther, and Mordecai. Zechariah, Ezra, and Nehemiah. These all godly men grew up in the land of captivity because of the sins of their fathers. It's okay. We can trust God. <laughs> and it doesn't matter. The consequences are okay if you keep trusting God, if you keep doing what he says, if you keep going after him. It's fine. It's nothing to be afraid of. Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego, and Esther, and Mordecai, and Zechariah, and Ezra, and Nehemiah, they did what Jeremiah instructed in Jeremiah 29, 12. You will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart, and I will be found by you, declares the Lord.